guys, good morning. So who knows what we're going to talk about today? Anybody? Anybody? Ah, come on. You guys know, right? We're always talking about this right here, right? What we have in the box. So today, we're going to be talking about geometric series. And they're going to be very closely related to what we talked about in the past, about geometric sequences. So let's do a quick review of geometric sequences. I have five examples for you. They could be or they could not be a geometric sequence. So I'm going to give you a little bit of time to discuss your neighbors which one of these you think it might be. So, work quietly. Talk with your neighbor. Alright, so to start us off, can someone tell us what the definition of a geometric sequence would be? Right. So, the definition of a geometric sequence would be where we have our terms A1, A2, A3, all the way down to An, and we would relate each one of them by multiplying by a common ratio. That common ratio can either be, you know, an integer, something greater than 1, equal to 1, or less than 1. So if we look at our first example, we can kind of see right away that it isn't a geometric sequence, right? We can look at this and say, well, we have 1, and then we multiply by half to get to 1 half, but we don't multiply by half again to get to 1 third. So that's gone right away. We look at B and we say, oh yes, this is exactly what we were talking about. We have 1, we multiply by 5 to get to 5, we multiply by 5 again to get to 25. It's a sequence. And so we can also see for C, that C is also an example, we're multiplying by 1 third. But notice what's different about it. We're not actually starting at 1. This time we're starting at 3. That's okay. In D, we can again see that that's not the case. We're not multiplying by a common ratio. And in E, we can see it's a little bit tricky because we are multiplying by a common ratio, but that common ratio isn't positive. That's fine. In this case, it would be negative 2. So we see we're not always adding, we're subtracting. So if we can notice that the underlying sequence is geometric, then the overall series, when we take each individual term and add them, is geometric. So these are really, really easy to compute for finite countable, say we have 10 things in our series. That's fine. But what if we have this dot, 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 right? What if it goes on and we have like a million terms, a billion terms, a trillion, you know, we're really just not going to want to do it. So, what I'm going to show you guys today is how we can compute it faster. And the way we're going to be computing it faster is by applying this definition. And this definition is the sum of a geometric series. So, don't be scared about this right away. We're going to go into exactly how and why this works. Right. So first we have to take a look at our normal characteristic for a series. And it looks like this. This is about the most generic formula for a series you can get. Notice that the first term is 1. That might not always be the case. So we're just going to operate with this for now and then adapt later. So we start with 1. We multiply by r. And we multiply by r again to get to r squared. So this is just merely exponential manipulation. We know that r times r is equal to r squared. Likewise, three r's multiplied by each other will get us the next term right here, r cubed. So you're looking at me and you're saying, Mr. Fleming, this is all fine and good, but you know, I just still can't see where this formula comes from. And the way we're going to look at it is we're going to look at two series that are very similar but slightly different and combine them to get that sum. So if we look at our first series, let's just write the sum of our geometric series is 1 plus 5 plus r squared. Let's include a few more terms so you can see the pattern. Plus r squared dot 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 r to the end. Okay. Now, students ask me from time to time, why did you do the next step? And the real answer is, a bunch of mathematicians a long time ago, they were just fooling around with stuff. They didn't know about this. They said, hey, let's try it. And so that's what we're going to do here. We're going to try it and sort of understand why it's helpful. So they said, okay, well we understand the sum, but that didn't really tell us anything, right? Because we still would have to compute all of these. What if we said r times that sum? How could that help us? So we'd have r times 1 plus r plus r squared plus r to the third plus dot 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 r to the n. What we notice is that when we distribute this, when we actually go through and multiply it, we'll get each successive term in the sequence above. So if we go through 1 times, let's just write it again, 
1 times r is r, r times r is r squared, r times i, r squared is r to the third, r to the fourth, dot, dot, dot. And can anyone tell me what the last term would be? The last term is r to the n, and we multiply by r, we get, yeah, r to the n plus 1. For the same reason over here, when we did r times r and got that one, we could also say r times r squared is equal to r to the third. Did the same thing, we just had n of them, we added 1, yeah. we have n plus 1. Okay. So, what we notice, just get rid of this piece sort of in the way, if we subtract these two quantities, what we'll get is we'll get some nice canceling out. We'll get the canceling out of r and this r, this r squared and this r squared, this r cubed and this r cubed, and all the way down until we eventually reach r to the n. And so what we've done, if we take the sum of n minus r times the sum of n, we will get our first term, which was not included in the bottom, minus, because we have this minus sign being distributed, right? minus r to the n plus 1. So what we've done is we've taken two series, multiplied them by something, and subtracted them from one another, and decided that we can describe that by only subtracting two numbers. Isn't that a lot quicker? Yes. So the question is, can we take this a step further? Can we talk about this sum by itself? Because that's exactly what we were trying to do over here. We were trying to talk about this sum by itself. And the way we can do that is applying the reverse implication of the distributive property. We could look at s of n, we could treat it as just some normal variable, which we've treated in the past. We could say this is, you know, x, right? So x minus r x. And in this case, we would say each one of these numbers has a common factor of x, so let's just pull that out. This would be x times 1 minus r. And we're going to do that just here. This sum is just exactly like a variable. So we will pull out this sum, and we'll be left with 1 minus r equals what we had on the right still. 1 minus r to the n plus 1. Okay, so to get the sum by itself, all we need to do is divide by this common factor. So we have now shown why the sum is equal to 1 minus r to the n plus 1 over 1 minus r. But aha, right? We're not quite done yet. This is a little different than what we had over here. We had times this a plus 1. Does anyone know why we have it multiplied by this a plus 1? It's precisely because of one of the assumptions we made early on. One of the assumptions we made was that the sum starts at 1. That doesn't need to be the case, right? In here, the sum didn't start with 1, it started with 3. And if we multiply by the a sub 1, it shifts everything into position, just like in here when we multiply by r, it shifted everything. So the only thing we need to do now is say we forgot to take count of the a plus 1, so now we multiply by it. Okay, so now we've covered finite geometric series. The only question is going to be, will this sum be defined if it goes on forever? And we will test that by looking at this formula. Because if the sum of this formula converges, then that series converges, because this is a characterization of that sum. So the way in which we're going to do this is we're going to take a look at the limit as n approaches infinity. Because n is our index for how large our sum is. So if we say that the number of terms in our sum goes on forever, we'll eventually converge to some number. So what we're going to do is we're going to apply this to the sum of n, which is equal to a1 over 1 minus r to the n plus 1 over 1 minus r. Now we look at this and we say, well, we're going to apply some sort of zero product property type rule, but for convergence. If we know that we multiply two things that converge, their product will converge. And if we multiply something that converges with something that doesn't converge, it's going to not converge, but we would also go diverge. So I notice that every time I can pull out a constant multiple of something, it won't, it, you know, it, that will converge to precisely what it is. If I can pull out a multiple of two, that'll converge to 2 forever because it is always 2. Looking at this, I can say I can pull out a multiple of a1 
over 1 minus r. Because when we look at our series, we'll always have r defined, and when we look at our series, a1 will always be defined. So this is just some multiple of what we're going to have left over. So the question is, when does this converge, right? Because I, one of both of these need to converge for the whole thing to converge. We've already stated that this converges. When does this converge? Well, if we look at this, again, we can split up into small cases, say one will always converge. So if this converges, then this must converge, right? So we look at r to the n plus 1. When will this converge? So when will it go towards 0? It'll go towards 0 if r is less than, um, what is it? Yeah, if r is less than the absolute value of 1. So what's another way to write this? That would be negative 1 is less than r is less than 1. And what this tells us is that we're dealing with things that are smaller than 1. So we know if we multiply decimals that are smaller than 1, they will always keep getting smaller, so they will converge. So if, if the ratio were 2, we keep multiplying by 2 forever, it's going to get insanely large. If we keep multiplying by things that are less than the absolute... Oh, what is this? Sorry. Um, no, that was right. Yeah, sorry. So if we keep multiplying by things that are less than the magnitude of 1, we will always get smaller, therefore this will converge, therefore this will converge, 